Hello, and welcome to Reflections. I am Rom Gaioso, your host. So first and foremost, thank you so very much for your being here with me and my guests today. I know your time is very important, and I am the guy who will make sure it is invested wisely. Uh, so today we have some very smart people, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be a very fun show. So stick around. We're going to talk about investment. We're going to talk about how we can stretch your proverbial R&D budget a little further. So specifically, we're going to talk about university corporation partnerships. So stick around. This is going to be a fun show. Uh, so uh, before I get started with the show proper, uh, I have to cover some ground rules and everybody's got some rules, right? So uh, let's start with uh, the rules first. Oh, right, Gene. So uh, we indeed uh, broadcast over a variety of different channels. Uh, so uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, YouTube, of course. Uh, so I'm very thankful for them because those platforms uh, allow us to broadcast uh, freely and allow us to have this kind of dialogue. But in exchange for that and to keep you know, the communities going, they have a few rules. So more specifically, they have rules governing or concerning the use of chat. And we're going to make a lot of use of the chats today. So we can summarize all those different rules and regulations as follows. It's just, you know, be nice, be polite, be courteous. And there's just one steadfast or golden rule. There is absolutely no hate speech allowed. So by the way, uh, the chat boxes or uh, chat windows are open. Uh, please do take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat. Uh, please say hi and let us know where you're watching from. And if you are listening uh, through the podcast, uh, please uh, go to our YouTube page and drop us a comment. I will make sure to acknowledge you and say hi. Now, I do have a very special favor of you to ask. So again, since there are several uh, chat windows going on at the same time, it saves me quite a whole lot of time. If you could please type hashtag ask, that is hashtag A-S-K, in front of your question. So this way, when I'm scrolling up and down through the chats, oh, well, I can immediately spot your question and pose it to the guests. By the way, there are several ways for you to submit a question. Of course, please uh, make use of the chat box or the chat window if you're online and live with us. You can also email me a question. Please email it to editor at imcimagazine.com or if you prefer to use the talk to text function, just text me your question to 001 for the United States 480 480-544-8372. So privacy rules apply here in the U.S. as well as Europe, in Europe and elsewhere. So I will not be saving your text. I will not be saving your number. Once it is read, it is deleted. So you're not going to get any kind of a nonsense uh, promotional materials from me. For that, you have to basically come into the page and, and opt in. So it's, it's safe. So uh, let's uh, move on to the first order of business. Uh, so that is our agenda. So what I'm going to be doing today, I'm going to be introducing my guests uh, one at a time, and I'll be following just an alphabetical order. And then after that, uh, if, of course, you can ask questions and make comments throughout the show, and we will be addressing them as, as we speak. But if you have that uh, uh, last minute burning question, uh, there's some time at the end where you can actually ask more questions and pose more comments. And again, if you are listening uh, on the podcast or you are listening to this as a recording, please go to our YouTube channel and leave the comment in there. I'll make sure I bring it to the guest's attention and uh, they will uh, respond to you. Okay. And then uh, towards the end, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming events. So we'll know, you know, what, uh, what to expect next. So the next and the upcoming shows. All righty. So uh, let's go. Uh, someone saying hi. 
so hello, Mary from Orlando. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for uh, your being here with us today. So uh, let's talk a little bit. Um, this is the brief introduction, uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So again, this is Reflections. We are the podcast and live stream partner of IMCI magazine. You can find us online at www.imcimagazine.com. We are publication in the United States on the registry 2769-0008. We are a member of Idahois America Media, and our focus is on intelligence. So competitive intelligence, market intelligence, economic intelligence, economic warfare, and a good chunk of the work of the magazine is on foresight and future studies. By the way, on the right-hand side, uh, what you see here is the front cover of our most current issue, and that one is on sensing. I will invite you to uh, please uh, go back and take a look at the magazine. Now, uh, our vision, the reason why we are here, is really to bring you diverse perspectives and voices to the debate. So I wanted to say a few words about the topic of the show today. So uh, two of my guests today, uh, Jamie Burns and Karen Walker, they do write about university industry partnerships. And in fact, they wrote a great article on this subject on IMCI's September-October issue. And this is really a great read, and I learned quite a lot from both Jamie and from Karen. So uh, you're wondering how to achieve your corporate goals faster, right? Well, you need to find allies and partners. Universities uh, do offer top-of-the-line researchers, knowledgeable faculty, and a sophisticated workforce. So why not take advantage of what they have to offer? So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, to the VC community. We have lots of uh, venture capitalists who actually watch the show. And I want to talk to this audience for a moment. So say you are an investor and you, you wonder if your investment in this new venture will actually pay off. Well, that's indeed a very good question, right? Say the venture has a new, yet unproven heart valve. Well, <laughs> a heart valve is something very important, something that can absolutely not fail, right? Well, that is a very risky kind of investment, right? Yes, it is. Well, but see, the biomedical device was developed in conjunction with ASU engineering. And the monitoring software was developed with aid from Stanford's computational labs. Now, all of a sudden, your risk investment sounds just a little bit better, doesn't it? Well, your investment is placed on top of a product created by top engineering talent, and the computational requirements were handled by the most sophisticated computational science crew you could possibly find. I'm sure you'll feel more confident about your investment. So I promise this show was about investment, right? So yes, we're going to talk about your investment. Now, perhaps you are the product developer yourself, right? So then it's wise to seek partnership with universities. Just think about it. What if you can get one of these prestigious schools here today to research your choice of technology? All of a sudden, your R&D budget grew by multiples, and you did not have to spend one single dime, right? There is a side benefit here, right? All those students, they will be looking for internships over the summer. So indeed, you have the first pick at top talent. And these people, they will eventually graduate and will think fondly of your cooperation, remembering uh, the experience they had. Now, so perhaps you are neither, but you do have a complex problem at hand and you need some help. Well, let's say you do have this very complex problem. Maybe it's not a heart valve. It, it's something else, right? So who are you going to call, right? The Ghostbusters. No, you're not going to call the Ghostbusters, right? You're going to, you know, going to have to find someone to answer your questions, right? So, well, good luck, you know, you know, much less someone to pick up your phone. One of my guests here, you know, Dr. Guang here, he has over a dozen Nobel laureates at his disposal. It may co cost him a cup of coffee, or well, maybe two cups of coffee, 
but I'm sure he will get the answer he needs. Okay. So next time when you're trying to figure out a way to get ahead or when you need a hand of creating this new technology or that fantastic new product, why not find a suitable partner? So this is exactly why we're having this show today. It is to ask my lineup how to go about making those university industry partnerships work. Okay. So I think uh, I talked uh, quite a lot about um, the university uh, partnerships and why we're here today. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to introduce my guests one at a time and in um, alphabetical order. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about Jamie Burns. So uh, she is with Strategic and Competitive Intelligence at Arizona State University. She is a member of the Committee of National Academic CI or Competitive Intelligence Working Group and a consultant to the National Organization of Research and Development Professionals. So uh, let's say hi and uh, uh, welcome, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you so very much for your being here with me and the guests and the audience. Looking forward to this talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. So uh, next, um, we're going to introduce, uh, one second, let me pull the information. We're going to introduce you to Dr. Joseph Wang. He is the executive director of strategic initiatives at Stanford University, and his focus is on computer science. So if you have a question about AI, data science, or machine learning, he's the person to ask. So uh, let's um, welcome uh, Dr. Wang. Hello, and welcome to the show today. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, Ron. Thank you so much, and, and so nice to have you here with us today. Okay, so next I want to introduce uh, our next guest. So Karen Walker, uh, she is the director of R&D at ASU. She's an expert in building competitive intelligence functions at academic institutions, and she works in both strategy planning and business development. So that is a great combination of talents to have. She's also a scientist on her own right with research on biosciences. So remember that heart valve, I, I think you can ask her about the heart valve and the cells and the molecules on the heart and what works and what not. I would not know how to answer that. So uh, uh, let's walk, uh, welcome uh, uh, Karen Walker to the show. Hi, Karen, so good to see you. Hey, Ram, it's great to see you again as well. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so very much. I think our, uh, our panel is, is complete today and uh, I wanted to get started. So um, first question that I have is really, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I hope I did a decent enough job at the introductions. I hope I didn't botch it too much. <laughs> but I really wanted to get to know you as a person first. So um, I really would like to know how did you arrive at your role? Was this something you chose, right? So another way to put it is uh, what excites you the most about university uh, cooperation partnerships? Um, Dr. Huang? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I worked in large corporations in the United States, both Intel and Boeing for over a decade. And then my wife is a professor at ASU. So I actually moved to ASU. That's how I got to know Karen and Jamie um, and got to know that and eventually led a team at ASU. And so our whole team's goal is to be the bridge between universities and companies. And that's what drives me is just finding the, the niche areas of innovation from universities flowing into the private sector uh, and changing people's lives. That's a great ground of ideas, right? So I think you are in a privileged position to see, you know, what, you know, people in research wants to know and what they want to advance and then what the students are curious about and then what the corporations want to do. This is great. So, uh, Karen, how about you? What excites you the most about this role? Well, I think one of the things for for me personally, you know, we we're very much at the very beginning of any of these activities, our CI team. A lot of times we're trying to scope out, you know, uh, 
what are companies doing? How could we have some sort of synergy? And so much like what Joseph said, thinking about the future, right? What would be the outcomes of these, these potential partnerships and trying to find you know, the best fit. So if we're looking at a company and we're trying to figure out, you know, oh, how could we partner up with them? How could we make a, you know, a nice offer to them? Like what would be the best thing that, that ASU has to offer? Uh, and then thinking about where would that go down the road and what could it lead to? What kind of eventual, you know, uh, technological outcome could there be that, you know, would wind up going to market? I think that's really exciting. Wonderful. Jamie? Yeah, for me, I think most exciting part of what we do is that there's so much variety. And so we're not researching the same thing every day. We get to look all across the university at the many different kinds of research that exist and kind of put, put puzzle pieces together and figure out, you know, what the best package to be. And I think that, you know, keeps every day kind of new and exciting and different. It must be exciting. I mean, and certainly you guys handle uh, so many of the different schools. So maybe one day it's an engineering project. The other day is Dr. Guan's computational science. And maybe the other day is biotech or mm -hmm. something. It must, must be exciting to be in this role and be this bridge between academia and, and the corporate world. So this is, this is indeed uh, uh, fun and exciting. I'm so happy you guys could, uh, uh, could be here today. So uh, I want to ask a, a different kind of question, right? So, uh, so how do industry university partnerships typically occur? Um, what is the ideal process? Is there a process? Uh, how does it take place? Or so maybe I will um, I start with Karen. So is there a process? What is the ideal process? Hmm. I, I think that's really a good question for Joseph. Let's start with Joseph then. All right. So. I would say, having been at this job for 80 years now, um, typically, if a company wants to reach out to university, it's based on whom they know. Maybe hmm. they meet a student, they meet a lecturer, they meet a professor. And in many ways, it's haphazard. Or if they're a research scientist at a company, typically they would go to a conference, they would meet their colleagues, their counterparts at a university. And honestly, that's a great way to start. But if you're a company executive thinking about R&D and investment, like Ram, what you talked about in the intro, you want to be more strategic and more thoughtful about it. My opinion is that the best way is to find the university's corporate relations office. So Stanford has that, um, one of the, those members. If you reach out to us, we can connect you with the rest of the university because we know or can easily find out the entire menu of ways of interacting with the university. And we can talk with you to find out what's the best fit. So I highly recommend reaching out to the corporate relations function at the university. And I know many, many universities in, in the United States and Canada in particular have these offices. So is that the same for ASU? So there is a corporate relations office that uh, we should reach out to? Yes. Uh, yes, there is. Okay, so there, there is there is there is indeed some some science and some method to the madness. So let don't don't have a burger with someone and start asking questions. <laughs> rather go go to the corporate relations office. So that's that's the uh, the best place to start. Therefore, that's right. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so I wanted to ask you uh, a different kind of question. Actually, this is uh, for all of you, and sometimes it's uh, a little bit. Uh, difficult for people to understand in those partnerships. So what do universities really offer? So why should companies seek out these kinds of partnerships? Well, I think universities offer an, a number of things that would be attractive to companies. I mean, um, we have this constant workforce pipeline from our students. We have subject matter experts in the form of our, our uh, faculty. And then we have, you know, basic research capabilities and facilities in a wide range of fields. Um, and, you know, now we're in this uh, global community, right? Uh, we, and we do so much of our communication and interactions digitally. So companies aren't really limited to, 
you know, the university in their backyard anymore. You can interact with universities uh, pretty much anywhere and leverage whatever their assets are. You don't, you're not really limited to somebody nearby. At least that's, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, to add a little bit more onto what Karen's saying, you know, looking at our university, ASU, I mean, we have, or in fall 2020, we had more than 127,000 students enrolled. So that's a huge yeah. workforce. And we had, you know, almost 5,000 faculty. The faculty have expertise across a variety of areas. And so we're offering partners access to both students and faculty. And again, you know, those faculty could be engineering, computer science, space science, you know, all kinds of different areas that, you know, just give them access to more than, you know, a, a smaller partner might offer. Yeah, I absolutely agree um, with both Karen and Jamie's points. So if you think of a foundation as students and the research, um, what happens is that it transforms the area. So economic development, it changes the area the university is based in. ASU changes Phoenix, Stanford, and Berkeley have long been tied with the Bay Area uh, for a long time. It's not only the university, just so that I'm, I'm very clear, but it's a very important partner in the transformation of a city. And so when you're a company looking at a region to move into perhaps a secondary plant or an office, you're typically looking at a mixture of talent, what other people already work there, what other industries already work there, and universities uh, can help in your decision. That, that's actually a good point because you know, we don't tend to talk much about this, but there are the industry clusters, right? So if I want to do biotech, well, I should look at San Diego. If I'm looking at you know pharma, I should be looking at you know maybe uh, Philly and things like that. But so there are the clusters, right? The industry clusters, so where you know most of the workforce is available. But then, um, if we are comp companies, we should be looking at you guys, the universities, and your specialty and what you have to offer. So, folks, again, the real value here, as the guest had, had explained, you know, um, access to you know the body of knowledge. I mean, imagine the amount of knowledge, the amount of research and think about it. Think about your own R&D budget. Right. So what if now you have, you know, ASU or Stanford University looking at your problem? So your your dollars, your R&D dollars just got stretched by several miles because those universities have top talent. Right. You know, highly qualified students. So you will be establishing relationships with the university, with the students, with the professors. And if those people cannot get the answers you're looking for, they know other people uh, that will have the answer. So there is a lot of value. And thank you, Dr. Kwong, for pointing out the economic benefit of uh, uh, working with a specific university because universities are an economic agent. I'm an economist. You should, you should, I should caveat that. <laughs> so you guys are uh, economic agents and you do bring uh, lots of uh, benefits to the communities. So uh, again, it's important for us to think about all that you guys said when we think, you know, why should we partner? The process of partnering, reaching out, reaching out through the proper channel and, and finding this, this, this specific partner. Wonderful. So I want to uh, kind of uh, uh, change uh, subjects a little bit. And so both uh, Karen and Jamie contribute to the magazine. And I wanted to go back to the guy, the articles you guys wrote. So specifically to you, so Karen and Jamie. Uh, so in, in the article you wrote, uh, you actually, and I want to emphasize that because Dr. Wang just, just mentioned this, right? It's not a good idea uh, to leave those very important decisions such as, you know, well, picking a partner uh, to chance, right? Or to an accident or say you, you had the proverbial burger next to someone or you are in a summit or you had a lunch meeting and you happen to sit, sit next to such and such, right? Rather, you, you advise, well, you should invest time and resources into this process, right? So why should industry conduct searches uh, to determine who the best university partner really is? Well, 
Right, Ram, that you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it was exactly because of those sort of chance meetings that we wrote the article because we kept getting requests, you know, from, from our leadership to, you know, look into various companies and we'd kind of go back and, cause we would look into these companies and we would be like, why are we starting a, trying to do a partnership with this company? You know, we wouldn't see any connection there. And we would be like, what's driving this? And we'd find out, well, you know, so-and-so sat next to so-and-so on a plane or so-and-so met, you know, this executive, you know, at a party or what, and it was just so ridiculous in our minds because of course we're, you know, we're analysts and our, our approach to everything is very methodical and measured. Right. And, and so we thought, okay, this is, you know, crazy. We're expending a lot of time and energy um, on doing this. And, and they they were having all these meetings and, you know, getting together and a lot of times nothing would really come of it. So we thought, okay, you know, what would we do? What would what sort of best practice would we put around this? And so we we knew kind of what we would do from the university side. But then we thought, oh, could we maybe put together an idea for how you know the industry could approach universities? And that's really, you know, where the the article came out of. Yeah, and so we just really you know talked about how using the CI techniques that we all know, you know we can apply those to universities. Universities are very good at publicizing the work they're doing. And so, you know, it's not terribly difficult to do, you know, targeted searches and kind of discover which universities are doing research in the fields that are relevant to your company. And then you can determine, as just said, who you want to contact, i.e. the corporate engagement office, yeah. rather than rely on those chance meetings because those offices can kind of open up the university and show you you know, here's exactly who we have doing the exact kind of research you're looking for, rather than, you know, we met and now we're kind of back filling and trying to figure out how to work together. And really like that upfront time investment can help tie so, or strengthen really the link between your technology development and your corporate strategy. So it all kind of comes together nicely versus, you know, kind of haphazard. Yeah, so the issue of, of haphazard is complicated because we don't leave strategy to chance, right? So and actually, Karen is an expert on strategy. <laughs> Jamie also. So, uh, and often uh, people say, well, you don't do that, right? We have our processes. We have the strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. So why should a partnership so important? as the university industry partnership be left to chance or to you know to accident right so i, I really like the fact that in the article you guys expel this out i mean there's nothing wrong i mean if i sit next to someone in an airplane and we start talking i'll certainly inquire but as karen explained you know uh wasting uh corporate resources and, and in, in industry resources and university resources that they could be otherwise working with the right partner right uh, on, on something left to chance, that's that's not very wise. So again, if you are that that VC, that, that investor, right, you want to do some homework. If you are creating the the product, the next and the best thing after sliced bread, you want to invest some time. Uh, and Dr. Guang explained, you know, go to the corporate relations office, find those people, talk to them, investigate. So maybe you indeed uh, you're looking for help with um, um, you know oil prospecting. So maybe you should be, I don't know, UT system. You, you should, should, should be looking elsewhere. But hey, I have a, a complex AI problem. I have a new software that I'm using to recognize potential threats um, of people who are boarding an airplane. Well, you know what? That's Dr. Guang. That's AI, right? I have an engineering question. You know what? ASC engineering. Oh, yes. Uh, the semiconductor engineering, a en complex uh, materials question. Yeah, so do a little bit of homework. It's not at all different from the strategic planning process. You sit mm -hmm. down, you plan, you and I think you guys did a great job at explaining the objective, right? So what is the objective of the partnership? What do you want to get out of it? I think it's important from the industry perspective that people are clear, right? So for example, I can't go to Dr. Kwang and say, I expect you to write my entire program and give it back to me. It's going to say, well, uh, what are you going to do then, right? 
So uh, we need to be upfront. We need to be clear. We need to have objectives. Those objectives need to be discussed, right? Uh, spelled out, planned, and then we go into, into the execution phase. But I, I really think it's important, and your article did a great job at highlighting just that. You know, And I think it's important that we focus on the strategy around the relationship. It's not left by chance. It's not by accident, but rather by design. So when we design something, it's no different. The picking, and imagine those universities have hundreds of millions of dollars of R&D. So why shouldn't we, we should be knocking at their doors, please, you know, work on my problem, not somebody else's problem. Help me make the best product, me, not somebody else. So these people are here and these people are available. So reach out to them. So uh, Dr. Huang, you had some thoughts about, about the process. Yeah. Uh and again, selfishly, it's uh, folks like myself and my team that will work with you, uh, the company, and ask those very questions. W what's your goal? And, and I will typically explain to people what the university's goals. And they may not be one and the same. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about the overlap and where we can work together, uh, where it makes sense to do so. And talent. Uh, most companies that approach me want talent and especially a place like Stanford they're in very very high demand you know I can give you quick advice on how to go about finding talent so again the corporate relations office is a fantastic place my colleagues at Stanford my colleagues at ASU my colleagues across the universities um, I, I know a lot about the North America I know less about the other regions but you know my colleagues across North America are here to help you our goal is to be a guide uh, a bridge into the complex world of academia you know that's excellent that's an excellent point as well so you know it's not just the industry's goals and objectives but also the university so it's a partnership so it needs to work both ways so it needs to be a problem that you know i want to solve but it must be a problem that you want to work on right so that's it's, actually correct yeah it's a a uh, two-way street so uh we have uh, some more um uh, questions. Uh, so uh, specifically, I'm going to ask this question uh, to the panel. Uh, so hi, Mary from Facebook. Uh, hello, and thank you for watching the show. Uh, I wonder uh, from the perspective of the universities, if it is too difficult to perfectly comprehend exactly what corporations really need to do uh, a better job with the help uh, they can produce. So what do you guys think? So I'll take a crack um, at this question. So folks like myself and my team that have worked in industry already, typically 10 plus years, can help translate the needs of the industry into academic speak. <laughs> and we can translate academic speak into corporate speak. And, and that's our job because we served both sides. Um, so today the team at Stanford, uh, um, my direct reports have worked in industry. I myself worked in the semiconductor and aerospace. My former team at ASU, uh, they've been directors and vice presidents before of very large companies. And so we know what drives very large companies, their R&D budget and, and how corporations think. We also know how very large universities think. Um, so Mary, to, to answer your question, I think it, again, it helps to contact a specialist because we have been in both worlds. So Karen and Jamie, I don't know if you have more comments. I, I think you answered that pretty well. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and I think this is yet another important point in terms of culture, right? So we think about it and we selflessly tend to look at ourselves. So the corporate culture, right? And Dr. Quinn just explained, well, there's, there's this corporate speak and then there's the academic speak, right? So we need to understand that culture and maybe we don't because we don't belong, right? And that's why he explained his team is a good translator 
So they work both ways. And, and remember, there is this revolving door between industry and academia, right? And there's this symbiotic relationship. But we need to find people who speak all of those languages, who understand the corporate culture, right? Along with the culture of the university, right? And the people who can make the connections or, or translate one speech into the other. And by the way, so this is an international show. We may be talking uh, about a company in Canada. We may be talking about a company in Germany that is very, very different. Uh, I mean, simple things, but let's let's talk about European Union, right? So the privacy rules. So, you know, uh, maybe Dr. Guan can send me a file very easily uh, from California to Arizona and vice versa. But when we, we're sending files across the ocean and across jurisdictions, all of a sudden we have to understand those nuances and and, and how to behave and etc so this there are all those languages all those cultures and subcultures so we have the team culture we have the group culture the corporate culture the university culture the national country culture all those cultures and again um, it's great to have people like you and, and the corporate relation offices who can translate uh, and I think, Dr. Juan, you said it, uh, you build bridges between people. So that's really what we need, this, this bridge building exercise so that uh, uh, the partnership is advantageous to all of the above. It's advantageous to the university because you have a practical problem you'd like to work on. It's advantageous for the corporation because actually you have someone with great skills and a huge R&D budget focus on your problem. If you're a VC, right, gives you the comfort, right? All of a sudden, oh, my AI uh, um, competitor to the to the virtual reality product was actually created by Stanford Computational Labs. <laughs> you wow, you know, you 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 have something, right? So for the VC community, it gives you that extra cushion. It minimizes your risk, right? It maximizes your benefit. And you can make sure if, again, let's go back to, again. Karen knows about the heart valve better than I do. <laughs> let's go to. That's not my area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> you have your cells. So uh, let's say you are indeed working on a vaccine or you're working on, on a drug, on, on drug development. That thing cannot fail, right? You cannot give bad vaccine to people, right? So, uh, you know, Dr. Kwok and I have similar backgrounds. I work at Intel and I worked at Boeing, right? Uh, so the airplane cannot fail, uh, and hopefully the microchip that you put on the satellite that is in orbit, that cannot fail either, right? So it is investing in, in those relationships with universities in a true partnership that, again, you minimize the risk, maximize the R&D budget, protect your investment, make sure you have, you know, top products out there and you have access to this, you know, magnificent body of knowledge and these wonderful people who some will be graduating and be walking into oh. your office and will be working along with you. Some will remain in university, but the relationships were built, right? So how often uh, uh, I go back to people who are in academia and we discuss problems, right? Hey, pick up the phone, call Dr. Juan. What, what do you think about this? You know, Jamie, what do you think about that? Karen, what do you think about this? And if they don't know the answer, they will get you someone who does. So this is the beauty. There's so many values of uh, university corporation partnerships. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, the issue of culture, and we could uh, talk an entire hour about um, about uh, about that, about culture. Um, and so I want to ask a, a slightly different uh, kind of question. I, I want to. Again, focus on the article, so Karen and Jim, you wrote. Oh. And again, so this is slightly different, but you know, there are literally hundreds. And if I go across the border, there are thousands of universities to choose from, right? So there are endless possibilities. So is there a way or how do you advise companies to compare universities? Oh. So what are your guys' thoughts? Actually, also your doctor one. How can corporations compare? Sure. So I think the first step, as we've talked about, is that internal needs assessment. And so the company figuring out, you know, what their research gaps are, their challenges are, you know, what do they want to achieve? And then again, going to the corporate relations team 
and talking and kind of doing that translational work. Um, you know, part of that might involve the company talking to their own R&D group, understanding their strategic goals, you know, looking at like squad analysis, strategic planning, that sort of thing, to kind of refine their ideas. And once they have that understanding of what they want to achieve, you know, then corporate relations can help kind of, you know, figure out those keywords, those concepts that then match into a university. And there's a ton of databases that can help compare university performance. You can ensure that you're working with the university kind of most prolific in the areas you're you're wanting to tackle. Yeah. There's yeah, like Jamie says, so there's there's a lot of tools, some are public and some uh, you have to pay for. And I think the two chief metric areas that we look at are funding and publications. Mm -hmm. So for funding, we're primarily looking at awards. And if you um, if you want to look at, at public databases, the two ones like we typically look at uh, for awards, which are, are going to be primarily grants uh, here in the U.S., we're looking at like the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health. They have really um, robust databases that you can look at. And, and by using those, you know, you can look for certain research areas. You can figure out who are, you know, leading in funding, uh, not only by institution, but by individual. So you can you can get a certain granularity and figure out, you know, who are the leaders in the certain areas that you're interested in. Um, and then, um, with publications, again, there's a number of uh, things like Web of Science and other stuff you can go out to and um, look at things like uh, who's got the most publications. You can look at citations and other metrics like that to figure out uh, who's leading in different research areas. And then if you want to uh, subscribe to tools, there's uh, Dimensions from Digital Science, there's SciVal from Elsevier, and there's a lot of other similar tools that you can use for benchmarking. Uh, to go out and, and look at different institutions and figure out who's leading in, in different uh, research areas and do that research for yourself. So actually, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because um, all of you are in competitive intelligence as well. So we should really perform this step and understand who is working with who, right? Who is doing what? Uh, so uh, think about it. Let's say you chose one specific university and you're working with them and little did you know that your competitor is working with somebody else in that university so you know there are questions in there that we have to ask so we have to do due diligence from from the ci perspective we need to understand look at the publications uh, look at the partnerships so there are wonderful tools out there to understand networks and networks of people mm -hmm. networks of researchers right and then we can say, uh, okay, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't work with this. I should work with that because my comp direct competitor is already working with this institution. And maybe you don't want the commingling of the funds. Maybe you want your research to be done by a certain number of people that are not connected or are not related to what your competitor is doing. Remember, in private enterprise, uh, one of your goals is, you know, get a patent, right? So you certainly... I uh, want to work with the universities that have the cleanest possible slate so that you start from scratch and you're partnering with them. Hopefully you're going to end up with a couple of one or two or maybe many patents, uh, joint patents that you and the university developed. And that's going to be truly novel work. And your competitors have no clue of what you're doing, uh, as opposed to if uh, there's commingling of research that's complicated. So it's best, as you know, Karen suggested, you know, go through the publications, uh, go through the networks, uh, understand this is a CI function as well. And actually, Karen is an expert at setting up CI functions at academia, right? So uh, I, I have done it at one university, Rom. I don't know if that qualifies me as an expert. <laughs> You certainly write a lot about and you're very knowledgeable. And so uh, it, it's great uh, that you point those things out. By the way, folks, CI it's not exclusive to private enterprise, right? Universities have CI, universities have CI functions. Uh, they look at corporations the same way we look at them. So, uh, and I think the beauty of the article you guys wrote is, uh, uh, think of it in CI terms, right? Think about the relationship in CI, in competitive intelligence terms, and, and, and you can wear those hats too. 
it's not just the VC or, or the product developer or the strategic planner. It is the CI, the CI function looking at this. And is this the best partner comparing, contrasting, finding, and now looking at the network and, and actually issuing a recommendation, right? So Dr. Guang, I'm sorry, you had some thoughts and I, I started talking because he said CI and then I got off on the tangent here. Yeah, just one, um, one thing to add. So competitors have been known to get together to fund one university or a group of universities. Uh, that's called a consortium. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they would do that is they would invest in a pre-competitive space. So to mature an idea to the point that each company can then put their own IP on top of that. But each recognizing that it's too risky, the idea is too immature at this point for any single company to fund. So Semiconductor is uh, a yeah. great example of this, where many uh, of the biggest players, actually all the biggest players in the US, have come together and created 10-year roadmaps. The tool makers, the fabs, the designers says, hey, I if I have this roadmap, then I know at what point I can call upon what design to make these products possible. But no single company has that type of R&D budget. So they all pull their resources together into a bunch of, it's a consortium that funds universities to push the frontier of human knowledge. So that's a great example of how companies can come together to pre, a pre-competitive space. Yeah, uh, so lots of industries do this. You, you made a very good point. So I just wanted to remind people, so there's a difference in here between applied research and based research. So we, in corporate space, we are on applied research, right? We, the, our goal is to make a product, to make a sale, right? We have to come up with a product. But we really need, and those big consortia, they are in touch with universities and universities work with, you know, national labs because they are doing the base research, right? The, the, as Dr. Huang explained, before you have a product, you have to advance science, right? And that's costly. But if you want to position yourself, oh, I have my, my applied research project. Well, I, I should be looking at the people who are doing the base research first and partnering with them and working with them. Maybe it is, uh, Dr. Huang was in Boeing, so advanced materials, right? So uh, that that uh, ceramics, the new ceramics or the, the new the new type of a metal ceramic that can withstand extreme heat or vibrations, so who does that kind of work? So before I have the the new nacelle, uh, or the, which is a component of the turbine, I have to work with the universities in material sciences or the people who advance material sciences. So again, we are in applied space, and we. Our, our budgets are limited. We really need to cooperate or seek cooperation with universities and universities do work along with national labs that do advance base research. Again, maybe it's, it's your um, materials questions. Maybe it's your drug development, your compound, your next compound. No one single company has such large budget that could, uh, maybe Walmart does, <laughs> If Walmart wants to go into business, but no one has the business, uh, there enough money uh, to fund. And again, folks, remember a lot of the work that universities do is exploratory, right? Before we can get to a product, they have to invest hundreds and thousands of hours into research, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of resources into discovery. And some things pan out, some things do not. Right? So uh, as corporations, we, we cannot make those kinds of bets, right? To create something from scratch, knowing that, you know, some of it or a lot of it may not work out, but the universities have the breadth and the knowledge to tackle the most complicated problems and help us advance science. And when science gets to a point close enough, then we can come in with applied research and do those partnerships, if I understood what you said. Yeah, that's correct. The university spans basic to applied research up to about a prototype. And then companies span applied research, prototype, pilot plant, and manufacturing. So that's why there is this area of overlap 
and that's what my team does to tra translate the work into companies yeah so it, it's a very long road before we see a prototype right yeah i think um i don't know about your audience but the general public uh, do not appreciate the amount of work and sweat and money that went into let's just take the COVID-19 vaccine right how many decades of basic biochemistry research was necessary in order to create multiple vaccine candidates within one calendar year that is a, a feat of astonishment and yet it's been federal research for multiple decades for us to understand the basic biology and biochemistry to get us to that point. And so that's the role of universities, government, and pharmaceutical companies that have the wisdom to invest in universities to accelerate that process. So again, it's not just one way. So it's, it's a two way street. And I think corporations too, should look into investing or placing some of their R&D budgets into the universities proper, because again, they're the people who are closest to the problem, to the base research. And maybe it is that, that extra resource that got them to you know, get that new supercomputer that could perform that, that new calculations at a fraction of a millisecond, right? I, I'm sorry, Dr. Wang, fraction of a millisecond, right? Not in, in my days, uh, uh, when we're running software, I could do work on SAS on ASU computer labs, and I would write the code and hit enter, and then I could go and have a cup of coffee and talk yeah. to people. And kind of... <laughs> so nowadays, I, I think I, I'm not that old. I may not have that much hair, but I'm not that old. But uh, I guess the that server, uh, my phone today has more computing power than that server ever, ever had. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those are the things we need to think about. So maybe, uh, yes, uh, if you get those people, research one, universities to work on the kind of problems and your technology, that's a signal of success. But maybe if you can contribute to that success, right, maybe it is that extra effort that they needed that helped them get to the solution and get to the solution faster. So industry benefits because, hey, Stanford, it had another breakthrough. Uh, ASU had another breakthrough. And then you have that prototype. You have something to work on, physical to work on, you know? So actually, you know, Dr. Huang come, came from Huang as well. So the NASA Technology Readiness Indicators, right? Number five? Yeah. Prototype? Yeah. That's essentially so we, what I'm referring to, the TRL levels. Yep. The TRL levels. And so, folks, uh, for the people who, who uh, uh, are not interested, but you should understanding, you know, how much work and how long it takes. And sometimes you're screaming, like in the case of the vaccine, you're all screaming and throwing a fit. You have to come up with a vaccine well, as Dr. Wong explained. It takes a little while understanding the gene and the genome sequence and da-da-da. It takes a while. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of understanding. And they have been doing that for years before you could, you could think of a prototype or think about a potential solution. Right? So I uh, think it as partnership as a two-way street. Uh, yes, corporate uh, corporations benefit from universities, but we have to find the solution where universities too benefit from corporations. So that is symbiotic. It's a relationship, not not uh, uh, not an amoeba. Am I correct, Gary? Amoeba that's sucking up people's resources. We're not amoebas, <laughs> right? Or we shouldn't be amoebas. Uh, we should we should be the true symbiotic partner that seeks to understand the university's goals, objectives. Dr. Guan explained you know, the technology readiness indicators, who's closest to that proverbial you know product, who's closest to the prototype? Oh, someone's closer. Let's work with them. Let's give them resources. Let's help them get to that breakthrough. And everybody benefits. Everybody shares in the success, especially when there are big consortia like Semi or, or Pharma that are basically funding large scale, uh, large scale projects, right? Wonderful. So um, actually, I wanted to 
to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the pandemic. So you you mentioned you mentioned uh, COVID, and you know, Doctor Guan specifically, you manage several different engagements. I wonder uh, how exactly has COVID or the pandemic changed the industry university partnerships? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think COVID after looking back over two years now, we now know COVID affected industries differently. So there was a phrase coined earlier called a K-shaped recovery. Some industry like software industry did very, very well. Zoom in particular is a household name now, but a lot of retail suffered. Local stores at the mall, small mom and pop stores, a lot of them shut down. A lot of restaurants I used to frequent are no longer there. And that has affected industry university relations as well. And so what we found is that companies are picking their favorite university partners and sticking with them through COVID. And I, I dare say even increasing the investment in the university during that time. But to find new partners has been difficult. So your existing partners have become better friends but finding new partners have been harder. That has been changing over the last two years. Mm. Um, and from talking with my colleagues across different universities, that trend already existed prior to COVID, but COVID seemed to have accelerated that. And so to, to my university colleagues who may be listening to this, um, yeah, different industries are affecting you differently. And especially if you have friends in the software industry, like Stanford does, I think you're benefiting more. Uh, but if your industry partners are heavy industries, oil and gas, um, although I think it's turning a corner now, but for the last two years, it was suffering. If your friends are in retail or travel, that has been suffering. Actually, uh, I think uh, meatpacking, they suffered brutally, right? Because of uh, contagion and they shut down. And yeah, so we, we are affected differently. So I'm sorry, what about the ESU experience? Is that different? Well, Jamie and I are much further away from the end engagement like Joseph is. So I, I don't think we can speak directly to it. I would assume that it's probably very similar, though. Yeah, it was very similar. I switched jobs in the middle of the pandemic. And so during the first year of the pandemic, that was also true. Uh, the existing friends, semiconductor friends in particular for ASU, were very good friends. And we thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> but other industry suffered. Yeah, we were, we were all impacted uh, differently, I believe. Right. Okay, so I wanted to ask a slightly different question. So uh, do you have a vision? You know, what is your vision for university industry partnerships? Is there a model? or uh, an ideal company university partnership, what would that look like? I guess I can take that question again. <laughs> I was ready for Karen or Jamie to jump in. Uh, ideally, the two institutions would align in, in mission. So if a company has you know similar culture similar vision of the world as a university we find that those are great partnerships um, students who graduate from the university emotionally latch onto the company and want to work for them because the company funds research in areas that the students and the faculty care about uh, if the company has um, a large R&D budget, some of which they devote to university to solving really complicated problems that they're willing um, to let the university publish, right? Universities driven are driven by publication metrics. So if the university is able to publish some of the results and share the knowledge publicly to, we talked about pre-competitive space earlier, to drive up um, kind of the, the benefits to all of society if the company is willing to do that. At the same time, the company can have a, a first taste or, or an idea of the new research that's coming out. They can consume that internally to make new products and also to hire the students 
um, that graduate from university to be a part of their workforce. When all those things align, that's a fantastic partnership. And mm -hmm. both ASU and Stanford have many, many of these great um, corporate friends that, that whose visions are aligned. And I mentioned economic development earlier. That's actually what you see when these partnerships are aligned and also geographically aligned, then the city transforms. Jobs start flowing in. The city becomes known for certain industries that attract other companies to then come and relocate. So in Phoenix area, TSMC relocated oh, yes. um, due to a long standing partnership between Intel with ASU and uh, Applied Materials has also invested in Phoenix. In the Bay Area, software. It was semiconductors for a long time. In many ways it still is. Uh, but software is, is now overtaking, overshadowing um, almost all activities, even biotech companies in the Bay Area for the exact same reason. Because companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and Netflix um, invest in the ecosystem that produces talented new engineers that know how to solve problems that are industry relevant. Meanwhile, professors are working on cutting edge research that we don't yet know whether it has application or not. But guess what? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, those ideas are then consumed. And you're able to solve problems that you discover 15 years later and you look back and say, oh, someone already solved that in the journal article and that they've made available in GitHub. And I can contact those professors and consume that research internally. And so you build up that ecosystem. So that's what an ideal partnership looks like. Multiple prongs, multiple connection points, whose mission and vision align, whose culture align for the flourishing of the city, of the region, and nation and the world at large. Wow. That's great. So that's that's really good and ideal. I do have an, another kind of question here for the university. So, so how do we solve the problem where students without any work related uh, experience in their field uh, can be hired instead of uh, asking for their previous work experience? So the idea of if we don't offer starter jobs to students mm -hmm. who are really starting they are not going to be able to really complete their academic curriculum. So how, how do you guys uh, create those opportunities uh, for people who actually uh, have no experience in their studying? Yeah. How do you yeah. guys go about that? Chicken or the egg problem? Uh, chicken. And may, may I take this one again, uh, Jamie and Karen, with mm -hmm. permission? Um, so if you're from the company, you can work with the university on capstone projects. Those are senior level classes. Um, many universities will work with you for fairly cheap fees, honestly, and you scope it so that the students can finish that within the academic year. And so it's a way for the students to put on the resume, hey, I worked on Boeing's capstone project. I worked on Intel's project. You know, I, I worked on um, uh, this robotic uh, surgical company's project, right? And here's what I did to demonstrate to a hiring manager a year later, there's some practical project management and team working skills. So if you're the from company side, consider giving universities capstone projects. As an individual, you can talk to your manager and consider teaching at the university. You could do that at night. You could do that on the weekends. We have classes set up for kind of more applied engineering you can guest lecture if you know a professor or come to the corporate relations office who can put you in touch with people or you can take an entire class teach the entire class yourself get exposure to students give them practical problems to solve as a project or as a homework flip side if you're a student what should you do I, i'm not sure whether the person who asked the question is a student or from the industry if you're a student ask your professors for research experience get summer internships sign up for capstone projects, ask around the university for the resources available to you, um, do volunteer work. At ASU, there is something called EPICS for the engineering students where you could work on projects for nonprofits. But 
you can build innovative engineering solutions that benefit nonprofits. And then nonprofits, I don't believe they pay, or if they do, it's very little, um, just to cover some basic materials costs. But you as a student gain experience that you could put on a resume. So there are some practical ways for you to consider helping out uh, students if you're on the company side and for students to find opportunities. So let's look for those capstone classes. So if you're a student, right, uh, look for the capstone. And if you're a corporation, maybe you're a VC, reach out to the universities and suggest or offer or volunteer your time and your right. skills. And I think everybody benefits, as Dr. Wang explained, you know, we all benefit from from this symbiotic relationship. Again, no amoebas, we, we don't like amoebas, we like symbiotic relationships where uh, we all grow. Wonderful. I um, I wanted to ask a slightly different question here. And I know it's a little bit on the esoteric side, but I, I ask esoteric questions uh, once in a while. This one is proper, it's, it's not too off the wall, okay? So I think the role that you guys do, so universities in general, you democratize access to knowledge. So you make it available to everybody. Right? So uh, not all companies are Fortune 500 companies that have you know hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, R&D budgets. What if I am a small company, you know, and I can't afford you know all the ways to interact with the university proper? where can i get started or how can i get started so for the small guys how do you get into this game yeah i think the capstone is a great way since they're fairly cheap and you you just have to uh, scope the problem so that they're bite-sized uh so that seniors um, in their undergraduate program can finish it at asu there's another program called the practice lab in which you can pay the university, uh, they'll put a professional project manager team together that manages student uh, as workers. So student workers, these are engineers, uh, business majors, um, whatever the project uh, is needed to work on your project. And that's outside the classroom experience. So the, the capstone is bounded by the academic calendar. Practice lab is not bounded by the academic calendar it follows um, your business cycle and it, it's it's more like a subcontracting um, you know if you want to need some work done not by phds or professors that are doing cutting-edge research but you want some practical things done um, i would look into practice labs and karen and jamie could help you get in touch with those people and so there are ways so you don't have to be a fortune 500 company uh, to engage with the university, right? You That's can, right. you know, as you explain the capstone. Or, and by the way, we're not talking about a bunch of, you know, weirdos, uh, you know, talking about stuff, but rather there's a project manager, there's a structure, there's an objective. It's, it's run just like a business. You know, it's not the students going off and doing whatever they want. It's There's a goal, there's a timeline, there's a schedule. So this is small investment and big payoff because guess what? If the student doesn't know the question, the student will ask the professor. If the professor doesn't know the question, he's going to call Dr. Guang and have one of the dozens of Nobel laureates answer the question. So for a small investment, you actually can get a very big payoff. Or maybe it is a practical problem and you don't have the bandwidth or you know you don't want to hire an additional person. But hey, there's this, this highly capable people, hungry, for practical problems. Bring those practical problems to the universities. They want those, right? Because they certainly have lots of research ideas, lots of base research, and they're thinking, well, what else? where else can I apply this? Oh, I can apply this here. I can apply this there. So it's an inexpensive way of, of getting access you know, to top-line researchers, uh, to uh, a very capable, very sophisticated workforce for, uh, again, a very small investment, right? Well, uh, woof, uh, this was um, so much fun. I think we uh, really exhausted uh, all the time we, we, we had for today. So I can't, uh, I can't ask anymore, but don't forget, if you are listening to the podcast or if you're listening to us as a recording or you have that last minute burning question, please uh, go to our, our 
YouTube channel and leave the comments and questions. I'll make sure, you know, Dr. Guang, Jamie, and Karen get your questions and your comments. And uh, we um, uh, we can continue this conversation in, in this dialogue. Or if you would like to know more, you know, please reach out to Stanford, reach out to ASU, reach out to your local university, reach out to the university, as Karen said, across the pond, elsewhere. Uh, go understand who's got skills on what. Look at their publications, look at their researches, look at those patents and, and find those partners. So uh, again, I wanted to uh, thank you so very much for uh, taking the time today. And folks, uh, you know, there's a uh, research one uh, type people. Uh, they are top of the top uh, and they took time out of their busy days to be here with us to discuss ideas and suggest and have thoughts and 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 uh share so thank you so much again this is part of that uh, democratization of knowledge that i think the beautiful thing that universities do is you bring all this beauty and for the investors all this research and those proverbial almost prototypes almost ready to go to market so um do engage uh with you know karen with Jamie and dr one here Again, so thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, continue. I wanted to uh, go to talk a little bit about the upcoming events. So on the December the 9th, uh, Science Fi, so Sci Fi Extraordinaire, Dr. Tom Lombardo will be here with us. Uh, on the 17th, we have Alicia Baena, she's a Mexican futurist. And I have Dr. Stefan Bergheim from ZGF uh, Institute in Frankfurt, Germany. We will continue. Please continue to send your thoughts and your comments and your questions. So we'll continue to talk about technology. Uh, I know the metaverse is too big, so we'll continue to explore the metaverse and sustainability. So we'll continue to bring guests uh, and universities to continue this conversation around sustainability, the metaverse, and other technology questions. I have uh, several authors to come online. So Joyce Joya is the author of uh, uh, Herman uh, newsletter. It's fantastic. If you haven't read it yet, go take a look. And there's several events being planned. So Markets and Markets has a few uh, different uh, roundtables. Frost and Sullivan has uh, a few different events on innovation and how to find those breakthroughs. Uh, the RI uh, Institute in, in Germany also has a new conference. So we have lots of things uh, to explore and lots of things uh, to talk about. So I guess it's time uh, for me to uh, move to the thank you. Again, I wanted to take this time uh, to thank you so very much for you know taking time out of your busy day uh, to listen to the show. Uh, please continue to offer your comments, your thoughts and your suggestions. Everything is read, your comments are read. If you have questions, I will follow up with Dr. Guang, with Jamie and Karen. I will post uh, the, those questions to them and, and certainly they will get back with you. So let's continue the dialogue. Again, even if you are not live with us, you're listening through uh, um, the podcast or as a recording, as a lot of you do during the weekend, please come back and let's continue this dialogue. Again, uh, thank you uh, so very much for your time here today. And uh, I will leave you with our institutional message. Thank you.